Okay, we are live with Andrew Topping and Nick Karadza. Um, we were just talking about... Uh, it's Nicholas Alexander to you? Yeah, Nicholas Alexander. Yeah. I don't know, Nicholas Get Alexander right. Karadza. Nicholas Alexander Karadza. I'm Tomislav Mio Karadza. Two days, sounds like, doesn't even sound like they're brothers when you look at it that way. Um, Nicholas Alexander. Yeah. Well, we go through customs at one point when we go crossing a couple of times when we were crossing into the States for flights when we were flying out of Buffalo and I guess the Canadian dollar at that point was above par and you could, get, you could fly out for like one fifth of the cost of, of Pearson. So we we're going down there and sometimes it was um, my name they were okay with the customs officers, but they would look at your name and they would ask you a couple of questions. They kind of, yeah. they, they kind of just kind of paused at that. They're like, what, what is this? You know, so it just changed things a little bit. <laughs> What's your, Andrew, before I forget, do you have a middle name? I do have a middle name. Yes. What is it? Or is that like top secret because you use it as your password? I do not use oh, it as okay. my password. No. Okay. My, it's my father's name. So my middle name's Rick. Rick. Huh. Got it. Rick. Andrew Rick is far. It's a far cry from Tommy Slav Mio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well, yeah, my, Mio uh, is our, is our name grandfather's name on one side. And uh, Alexander is our grandfather's name on the other side. And then Rick is your father's name. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder, I saw a bunch of people don't have middle names. It's a very confusing kind of thing. I don't use my middle name a lot but no i have i one. sign sometimes i sign off emails with my middle name meal <laughs> you're not supposed to laugh when i say that <laughs> I, I don't think i've had that happen <laughs> no it's usually just internally here at rockstar i'll send off an email and sometimes i'll just sign off on me but you're right it is hard not to laugh when you hear that <laughs> Anyway, listen, we're here. Forget about middle names. We're here to talk about something very serious, Canadian taxes. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to talk to you about the whole trust thing um, in a second. But I guess at this time of year, what are you busy with? Corporate taxes? You're not doing personal tax stuff right now. So it's just corporate taxes that are starting to get busy? Uh, yeah. So mostly corporate tax. Um, we're doing some personal tax for... <laughs> some that haven't filed for yeah, the last right. five years. Some of our close direct <laughs> friends we know are maybe a year or two behind on doing their taxes. So some some of it's personal, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but majority of... Every once in a while, I can't name a name, but every once in a while someone walks in here with a box of crumpled papers and then piles start getting sorted. And I always ask, hey, what is that for? And they're like, it's the last two years of taxes. I'm like, why don't you just get caught up? Like, I feel like you get caught up and then you let two years go by again and you're behind again. So what percentage of Canadians are behind on their taxes if you had to take a random guess? Wow. Uh, I bet it's like... Behind on their taxes, I'm going to say 12 to 15 percent. I would guess that's probably high. You think so? Yeah. Damn. So Canada's getting its ounce of blood from everyone, eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, the majority of people get. Well, they get refunds, but it's their own money, so it's not really a refund. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All of taxes are is our own money. <laughs> Let's just be clear. All of it is our money. <laughs> money. We just happen to separate ourselves from some money. To Ounce go to of the blood, blood t definitely sounds worse than than pound of flesh. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. That's how I feel like it is. Listen, the bank. Uh, you know, I'm gonna. I was gonna talk about this at one of these Rockstar Minute things we do. But the uh, in the last few days, I had at least five people send me this Globe and Mail article talking about the Bank of Canada and how they were. I don't know if it was in September or if it's current, we're recording this in November, where they were gonna start to lose money soon because the interest that they were earning on, I guess, um, the interest that they were earning, I guess, when they print money out of thin air and give it to us in exchange for bonds or, you know, you know how that works. And then the interest that they're paying out on crap that they've bought back, I guess, and or, or let banks deposit with them, yeah, pay overnight the, yeah. the, the rate. They're, they're, that rate is higher than what they're earning, so they're going to lose money. And, and I was just laughing. I'm like, here's an institution that, s sorry to drag you into this, Andrew. <laughs> so, this could be all me. This is all me, yo. Okay, this is not all this is all, it's not Rick. It's all me all right now. Is that uh, here's an institution that sets its own targets, inflation, misses its targets using data that it chooses to manipulate and change the CPI at its own whim. So imagine being a business where you're like, we're going to hit this target, and to hit this target, we are going to use this data which we control and change all the time. And we've chosen our target and we miss the target with the data that we report on. Like that's almost impossible to do. And now they're losing money and they print money for a living. Well, like like you, how it, you, when you, when you just boil that down, think of that. They can't hit the target that they hit themselves using data that they report on and manipulate themselves and they lose money. And I like how they, they put in the article that it doesn't really matter because they, they can kind of just 
create their own mo- more money. And so yeah. there re- no real risk. Yeah, the article <laughs> says something. It's not like a normal corporation. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. I was like, well, what kind of place is this that it's not like a normal corporation? Anyway, poor Andrew. We brought him into this and we didn't we, we'll steer. Oh, I'm sure he expected something about the central bank. By, <laughs> oh, by, for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> We didn't even get into Bitcoin. I, 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 I expected 45 minutes on the, on the central bank. <laughs> Sorry. <okay. laughs> we'll clear that up. We'll get that cleared out here. Uh, earlier, Andrew has, uh, yeah, we've had a discussion and I'm no longer professionally, under professional advice, allowed to buy any more Bitcoin. That's it. I've hit my cap on Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm good at ignoring professional advice, though, Andrew. Like, I take it in, I digest it, and then I let it go. You know, <laughs> that's your choice. Everyone makes their own choice. <laughs> I can vouch for that. I thought you were going to say everyone digs their own grave. I thought you were going to say it that. Way. You know what? Uh, you've been you've been proven right before. So oh, you're this, being very this kind. This might be another one of those. Oh, situations. geez. Well, you are being very kind right now. Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna just do the ostrich and stick my head yeah. in the sand for now. And <laughs> um, okay, so about the trust, what's going on in? Uh, you know, what, what should we be aware of? First, can you just lay out what, what they're thinking to change and what we all need to be aware of? Sure. So so back in, in 2018, actually, they started talking about um, extending the rules around what needs to be reported for various trusts. Um, originally, those rules only related to what I'm going to call an actual trust. So I've taken steps to set up a, a trust, like a family trust. Um, and the, the rules were sort of related to that and what needed to be reported in those trust filings. In 20, I want to say 2021, they started to look at extending or expanding those rules to cover bear trusts as a, 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 in addition to actual trusts. Um, and a bear trust is very, very broad. So it covers... Uh, like a joint venture relationship. It covers a beneficial ownership relationship um, and a bunch of other things. Uh, But in the real estate world, certainly there's lots of people that are using bear trusts in the form of joint ventures or in the form of beneficial ownership that are going to be impacted by these expanded rules. So essentially all they, or what they're going to do is require various additional information to be reported on the existence of the trust. So the fact that the joint venture exists prior to this new rule, essentially we only report what we need to report for tax purposes and that was it. The new rule is going to require a trust filing for any bear trust. So now I have to report f- with respect to real estate, the actual owner of the, of the real estate, the person or people on title, the, any beneficial owners, so anybody that's party to the joint venture now has to be reported on this trust filing. So the trust filing is going to provide CRA with the name, address, SIN, corporate name, business number for any people that are party to a joint venture or to a beneficial owner situation. So now there's just, there's going to be this additional filing that has never been required in the past. We're going to have to file this return on a go forward basis, and it is going to provide CRA with some additional information on the parties that are part of a joint venture or beneficial owner ship arrangement on a personal return in the past if you were had an income property um, am i remembering this incorrectly all you had to write was your percentage ownership of that particular property so this is and sometimes there would be no other paperwork there would be nothing else that is a trust of any sort other than two people agreeing hey we're buying this together and uh, we have a 50% ownership and we're just like handshake verbal yep. thing. But you're saying that constitutes a bearer trust agreement. Right. So in that scenario, under the assumption that one of the individuals owns the, actual, the, the properties in their name, titles in their name, very likely the mortgage is in their name mm-hmm. and only their name. The other party is reporting, as you mentioned, 50% of that agreement but they don't actually have any legal ownership in the property because it's, it's titled to one of the individuals. As you mentioned in that scenario in the past, person A reports their 50% share on their personal return, person B reports their 50% on their personal return. That was all of the reporting that was required. Nothing else needed to be done. Now they're gonna have to report the fact that that joint venture exists. 
So if you are writing, because because if I reported that income on a personal tax return, wasn't I reporting 100% of the income and expenses on that property and then just a box that had my percent ownership? So if you ever fill out that box and the ownership is less than 100%, there's going to be basically another field somewhere that says, well, you don't have 100% ownership of this property as per box so-and-so on your tax returns. So who else owns this property? Uh, Is that how you see it being implemented or no? Um, so the the trust filing is an entirely separate filing. Okay. So, we, so you're, you're going to do exactly what you've always done on your personal return. That doesn't change. But now we have this additional filing that it's going to report basically just the names of the people that are involved and the property. That's all that's going to go in the trust filing and it's going to be sent to CRA. So there's no change to the personal return. There's no change to mm -hmm. the taxation of the trust. It's just a change to the reporting requirement for who's involved. Yeah, I think so, one of the reasons, not just a tax reason, I think one of the reasons they've been doing this is to find out from the real estate side of things when foreign buyers have been buying through um, Canadian corps, and the ownership's been put into the corp. They want to see. They also want to see kind of that. I, I think it's this part of that initiative as well. Or, or no, am I wrong? Uh, there could potentially be if we've got beneficial ownership situations where you know maybe the non-resident actually owns it, but it's being reported in a corp, or it's being reported. It's actually owned by the corp, but the beneficial owner is a non-resident. So, so you could absolutely end up with scenarios where where that would be something that's going to be captured by the new requirements. So now CRA is going to know everybody, every beneficial owner, even if they're not on that person's tax return, but there's a beneficial owner involved in that property in some capacity, you're having to declare it with some additional form. That's right. So but what if you just, sorry, go ahead. So essentially personal tax is what we call a T1. Corporate tax is a T2. A trust return is a T3. So it's, a, it's an entirely separate return that's now going to have to be filed for every single joint venture, beneficial ownership um, arrangement, anything like that, anything that falls under the guise of, of a bear trust, which essentially is I have a legal owner and then I have a bunch of beneficial owners. But what, can someone just not file that? Like what if someone like innocent, like, like there's like innocently, like out of just, you know, ignorance or, and then there's- I, like, I guess they're gonna ask you to declare. So, so essentially there's a penalty structure that goes along with, like anything else with CRA, there's a penalty structure that if, if I don't file it and somehow CRA finds out about it, I'm going to be penalized for not filing it. Yeah, so, and that, so that applies to anyone, you know, any, let's call it, you know, residential real estate invest, you know, property owner that if they have some sort of joint venture on a property, what if they're, what if there's only like an, yeah, like what constitutes that? Like some people what get, if they're not on title. do family. So, well, I think, I, I think. So if you have, you're saying, yeah, they're not on title, yeah. but you have to declare. So if, if you have co-owners, so let's look at spouses. So both spouses are actually on title, actually on the mortgage. That's not a bear trust because they both have legal ownership. We're talking about one individual owns it and is on title and other individual or individuals are reporting some portion of that, but have no legal ownership. But have no legal ownership. So yeah, okay. Because most if, most joint joint ventures, joint ventures are that way. Yeah, okay. But what about if it's um, somebody, a family member who's given some form of deposit or down pay, that some form of money that's used to buy the property? They're not on title. They don't. They're not declaring any income. They're not declaring any expenses they really don't have any kind of involvement in this property that must fall outside of this. No, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking when I was, Oh, saying, sorry. Okay. No, no. It just that when I was saying that, that's, that's where I was going with it. But like CRA is not going to like, if somebody's help, cause that's what happens with investors a lot of time. Like a family member will help somebody purchase a property and they're gifting some amount of money for the down payment. That is, you know, the banks declare, this is declared at the bank level, banking level and stuff. But really, they're not involved. They're not benefiting from the property. They're not getting any expenses. They're not. As long, I guess, income. as long as they're not entitled to any of the, the they're not claiming any of the income. All the income's getting claimed by the other person. Then it's okay because they're they're not they're not in they're not expecting any of the revenue from it or any of the profits, and it's getting claimed elsewhere. Basically, as long as CRA gets their money, 
they don't care. So if they're getting their money, all their money from number one, then they don't care. So, and that's what brings me back to how you have it on your personal tax return. If you put that box that you don't own a hundred percent, that's the trigger. Yeah. If you fill out that box that on this property, you only own 50% or 90%, boom, you must declare then because you know, you must declare through this trust agreement or trust filing or whatever it is that I, I have other, you know, there's beneficial owners in this thing and here they are or other owners. Potentially, because you could still have, so on that form on the personal specific, yeah. I could have a co-owner that the reporting still looks the same. So if I have, again, spouses, mm -hmm. both own, both are on title, both are on the mortgage. I still say I own 50% because I'm only reporting 50%, my spouse is reporting the other 50%. I don't have a bare trust because I actually have both, both individuals have legal ownership. So, so you're right that it is the trigger oh, that there's it. someone else should be reporting, but it doesn't necessarily always mean that there's a bare trust. Got it. Oh my gosh. Now there's scenarios where um, one spouse is actually on title, holds the mortgage, but the property's being reported 50 50 between the two of them. Yeah. Again, technically there we have a bare trust. Mm -hmm. Even though there's very, it's extremely unlikely that there's actually a joint venture agreement or anything in place, but we do have a bare trust because again, we have le legal ownership in one name and being reported by multiple people. So, so this rule is extremely broad. So they yeah, felt they, perfect. They, they, they cast a wide net, try to capture everybody. We all work to collect money for the government in all different ways. You know, whether you, whatever you're doing, you're basically a tax collector. Uh, yes. Now, you know what this, my brother-in-law's Italian. He has this, uh, one of his cousins, an Italian guy that's built a successful business and towards winding down his career, he said, you know what? I reflect back on my career. And basically I've determined we're all tax collectors. If you're a baker, you're basically collecting taxes by baking bread. If you're a construction guy, you're building buildings, but you're basically, all of us are out there just collecting taxes for the man. And I just thought, damn, really? Is that what you reflect back on at the end of your life? Is that, is that how you look back on life? How do you choose to collect taxes for your government? <laughs> <laughs> what have you decided to commit your life to so that you can collect taxes for your government? Uh, it, it's not. There's an element of truth wrong, there, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, I know. Sorry, Nick, I cut you off. I don't know if you lost your train of thought there. I forget. Yeah. <laughs> but so they cast this wide net and it's broad and it's going to ca cause a lot of work for everyone. Okay, we talked a little bit about personal, but what about on the on a corporate tax returns? Does that change or it's roughly the same? It's the same kind of thing. It's the same idea. It's It's just the box that says how much I'm reporting doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So essentially okay. in the corp, I'm still, you know, from a tax perspective, what's being reported or how it's being reported is still the same. And if, if I'm a 50% joint venturer, then I'm reporting my 50% and the other joint venture is reporting their 50% in theory. But I'm still only reporting 50% in my corporation, there just isn't a box that says yeah. I'm reporting. 50%. Okay. So now it's, it's really just on you. And that's where I was mentioning to Nick that there's going to be some document that says, I, I declare that, that there's no other beneficial owner or something. I could see something like that coming to an existence. So, I mean, we were actually thinking about doing that because obviously from a lot of people are going to say, well, you know, it's, it's up to us or it's, it's part of our, I told my accountant to, to tell people that this thing exists. So if I don't tell you it exists and you don't tell me there's a joint venture, then we don't report it and you're potentially subject to penalties. Uh, so we were considering doing something like that where there, we would give our clients a form that says, you know, uh, this property is held, you know, by me or by me and my spouse or by mm -hmm. me and whoever, or yes, it's actually owned by someone else mm -hmm. or, or it's mm -hmm. not owned, but it's being reported by someone else. So. Um, I, again, there's there's no change to the taxation of these. This is really just a reporting exercise. In, in my opinion, it's a whole lot of time that I'm not sure is going to provide anyone with very much benefit, but it gives them a that, lot of intel though. But that's what I was wondering. I was like, do they really, really feel like this is a, a going to be a source, like to make all these changes, this is going to be a real source of revenue for them? I just, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's people that are excluding it, 100%. People exclude stuff all the time, right? So, but I mean, this is the, the source of revenue that they're after. It seems strange to me. 
But the Intel part of it, that's where I think, well, maybe they're more interested in so that. So maybe it really is a phone, foreign ownership thing, like what you said. Like maybe it's really... You know what? I take it back because that's giving them the benefit of the doubt because that makes gives us some logic and I'm, I'm done doing that. So no. <laughs> so I don't think that's it. <laughs> but it's true. But because I'm like, how much... Like, is there revenue there that they're probably missing out on? 100%, right? There's revenue oh, sure. everywhere they're missing out on. Like, does every, does every Canadian get their taxes 100% perfect? No, for sure not. So there's revenue there. But I mean, like that's it like that's that's their, yeah. their grand plan yeah. and i agree i mean i don't i don't think they're going to find hundreds of millions of dollars doing this but the the just to check all of the returns oh my gosh now again everything i mean it's going to be filed electronically and yeah but you know, still the cross-referencing yeah, required the cross is going to be difficult yeah just go to land registry and try to look all this stuff up even if, if that's what they had to do and so i mean they could do that and i think that's more labor intensive this is forcing everyone to do that work for them. That's right. And they just have a computer system that just matches it up, right? So now you don't necessarily need, I file a trust return that says, you know, Tom owns this, and I file another trust return that says Tom owns this. They can compare that. They can create a list of what Tom owns. So this also applies then to stock account, like trade, like investment. We, we used real estate, but can this apply to, I guess it does apply to everything, no? Uh, it, it would apply it's to just less. It happens less where we would have a bare trust. I, I don't know how often it would come up in like a business. Cause usually you would have the corp, you would be a directors or shareholders or something already. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if and I if was, you, yeah, I don't know that you'd have a bare trust a lot in the stock world. I'm sure you mm -hmm. can, but mm -hmm. I can't think of it because if you did have an investment account that was held jointly, both people or two people are involved in it. Usually both people or parties are on the account. That's right. So yeah. it's very clear. That's right. This yeah. person and this person are on that account. Okay. But, but if it, I gave you a thousand bucks to invest for me and you're only claiming half those gains, then I should claim it on my thing. But yeah, I mean, can, how often does that type of stuff happen? Can you do well, that? You can, but in that case, yes, yeah, something like that would be so. But the thing with, with investing is there's slips, right? Okay. So when you invest, oh. not necessarily with Bitcoin, but when you invest, Oh, did you just say, was that a slight at Bitcoin? <laughs> that was, was good. That place, that <laughs> Andrew, nice I like that. You that was good. Hey, that was a, hey, full respect on that. That was a subtle slight against Bitcoin. <laughs> and I'm a big boy. I can handle the subtle slights against Bitcoin. <laughs> it is not changing my opinion on anything. <laughs> it was just but, referencing but the I, fact I appreciate that. that. I can the, totally appreciate that. That the reporting for Bitcoin is not necessarily as, as oh. good as it might be for some. I don't oh, think, God. I don't think I, that's, I, a good, I, that's a good cover. I but. thought, uh, yeah, I thought you were just taking a, just a slight at Bitcoin, but you're talking about the reporting. That was a good, <laughs> yeah, Nick, he did cover that really well. Yeah. Okay. So if there were, if there's reporting, um, difficulties or inaccuracies or whatever on any, uh, accounts, investment accounts, um, no, but I think what he meant was what? there's a slip for the gains on the on the stocks because you have some sort of trading account. Mm. Then those slips get remitted. So if you're not claiming those, the government sees those gains, someone's going to pay tax someone's on those picking gains. It up. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's yeah. regular. Okay. So if I invest through whatever, RBC, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a yeah. slip. I'm Government's get a getting five, a T5, a T3, a whatever. It's really clean. There's no regulation per se mm -hmm. on a beneficial owner. So I go and I buy a property in yeah. my name. Yeah. And then I get my lawyer to draw up an agreement that says the beneficial owner of that property is my corporation. That beneficial ownership agreement doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get filed with anyone. The, the land transfer registry shows that I own the property, mm -hmm. but I'm actually reporting all of that activity in a corporation. There's, no, there's nowhere that reports right now that that arrangement between me and my corporation exists. So does it, does this go all the way to the point where if you close on a property in a one name, your personal name, can you claim income and expenses under a corporate name from day one and CRA doesn't really care as long as the income and expenses is reported from day one under the entity which continues to report it or must it match up with who's on the mortgage document of the, of the investment. No. Nope. So we, I mean, that's where that beneficial agreement comes in. So we see that all the time where okay, so I'm individual so, uh, owns it. Yeah. Legal titles in their name, mortgages in their name, beneficial arrangement is set up to report so that, that property in the corporation from day one, which is. So CRA part. is okay with that. Yep. They just now want to know, okay, who's that the beneficial owner. Yep. They want to know who the legal owner is because they know that it's being reported in the corp because obviously mm -hmm. the, the corporate return is getting filed with them. Mm -hmm. So they see the reporting. They don't know whether that 
property is owned by that corporation legally or beneficially. That's a slippery slope because I guess CRA could say, well, you know what, you, 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 the, the title is on your personal name and I'll collect more taxes as the government if you claim all this in your personal name. So put that revenue back under your personal name. Oof. So it, I don't I like mean, that. It's possible. Now, I mean, we're not at that stage. The arrangement is legitimate. There's, it's a, it's a, it's an appropriate, you're above board by yes. doing what we are saying. Yeah. yeah. But you see where I'm coming from. Yep. They could easily say, oh, here's one way to increase tax revenues. You're claiming income over here, but maybe we'd prefer. But I guess that's that's not really quite fair either if they were to do that. But, well, and that's but what's, I mean, but what's fair. Like, but in Ontario, like, I mean, we're a we're a common law province. OK, so under common law, beneficial ownership does exist. I okay, can have got a, it. I, I can legally have a difference between the legal owner and the beneficial owner. Got it. Okay. So I, it's a legal appropriate thing that you're doing. Yes. As long as you're actually claiming and paying your taxes, ultimately that's what CRA, you know, uh, and of course that makes sense. What That's what matters. Yeah. I, I mean, could it change where you can't put a corporation that you own personally in a corporation? It could. I don't foresee sure. it, but it yeah, could yeah. change. Yeah. Agreed. I don't really foresee that either, but we are in strange times, Andrew. <laughs> Who knows what we can see and not see in the future. Um, okay, so there's that. I think we covered most of the stuff that was on my mind on that. Uh, so now, in the because of the real estate world, like, you know, it's been, it's I guess it's been about 14 years, other than 2017, with a little blip of real estate prices just going up and up and up and up. Now that real estate prices have come down, are you seeing a situation in where anyone is... Um, properly and legally using losses strategically just in their real estate? Or is it a combination of, I might have some stock market losses or some Bitcoin losses, which I know brings a smile, brings warmth to your heart. <laughs> um, and I have some Bitcoin losses over here, so I'm selling it to, to get that loss on paper uh, because I'm gonna sell a property that has gains. Is that still, that's the number one way to do things? Uh, yeah, so I mean, Certainly, the just given the markets for both mm -hmm. currently, um, you not, can't even you, help not you, to be disparaging you, against you, Bitcoin. You can't even help yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we are going to have a Bitcoin Fundamentals 101 class with you individually in our training room. Okay, you're going to have to sit and listen to me speak for three hours. You're going to suffer until he's already. I've been there for two of the hours already. That he says I listened. <laughs> we just got him on gold a little while ago. Give me a chance. I'm trying to you know bring him up to speed quick here. <laughs> Uh, we should always invite guests to laugh at you. Yeah, oh, this it is, is great. Fun. It's fun yeah, for me yeah. too. I gotta admit, it's fun for me too. It makes you question yourself. Wait a second. <laughs> this person's an intelligent person. Why are they laughing at me? <laughs> what am I doing again? <laughs> um, the uh, um, yeah. Now we can't even stop laughing. I didn't even know what the question was. Oh, if I want, if I so, I had had some losses on Bitcoin. I could sell it take the loss on Bitcoin, sell a property and apply it against to the gain on a property. And I could buy the Bitcoin back if I wanted. I know you don't want to, but if I wanted to, I could buy it back, but there's a set time for me to buy it back. That's right. Yeah. So, so you can't sell something and buy it back immediately. Otherwise the, essentially the loss is disallowed. So I can't, I can't create a loss and then essentially keep the asset. So I have to wait 30 days between selling something and buying it back in order to claim the loss when I sold it. Okay. How do they even know that? Say I bought it next day. Like, what the uh, heck? I guess, I guess well, next year's filings, if you get audited, they would see that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah well, I mean, certainly from, a, from the perspective of anything through like a registered investment. Company, They're going to see the They're going to see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with, in the Wild West, like Bitcoin, mm -hmm, then. Mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. Yeah, but more I, I of these, all joking. I didn't say. <laughs> but, all, but, but some of these guys are regulated now too. So yeah, in, in that world, I mean. That's but right. even yeah. even the even the regulated ones, like they're not, you know, for the most part, they're to have to match up everyone's transactions. Difficult. It's probably not happening, right? I, I just know that but, anyone listening to this, if you try that, that's obviously the thirty days where you buy, you sell something low and it rockets up. Yeah. So thirty days, you know, naturally, just Murphy's law and that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's the time, or at least in my life, that's what <laughs> happens to me. If I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do that, and it's like those thirty days where things go up one hundred times, and I miss it but uh anyway yeah. okay so 30 day window and that applies to stocks but like basically anything you do on that strategy you have to wait 30 days That's before right. you buy it back yeah. to claim the yeah. loss to claim the loss yeah so and i mean it's, it's a good strategy if you have accrued losses and you sell something in this case you sell real estate that still has a big accrued gain mm -hmm. you can sell 
the losses, offset the gains, and then buy it back. I mean, if you obviously, if you still want to hold that, whatever it is. Um, and, and those losses, could, could those losses be applied to anything on your tax return? Uh, probably not. So, okay. so the losses that we're talking about are going to tend to be capital losses. So I'm selling stocks, bonds, uh, in so most somebody cases, who, Bitcoin. Okay. Um, I'm selling it because it was an investment. So I held it as an investment. I sold it. I have a capital loss. That loss can only be used against capital gains. Sorry, why did you say in most cases Bitcoin? Just because it's not clear how it's classified in CRA, right? Uh, now? No, I mean they're they're classifying it more or less as a commodity. Okay, but, um, you could be in the business trading. Of okay, got it. So that's trading. a different situation altogether, of course. That's right. Yeah, I get that. Okay, but somebody who's maybe doing a corporate tax return who owns something like stocks or Bitcoin and real estate in a corp. If they're going to sell one of the things that's at a loss and they think they're going to apply that loss against their corporate taxes, that might necess not necessarily be the case unless they're capital loss that's right. inside that corp. Capital gains. Capital. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Capital so gains inside that corp. So if I'm going to trigger losses, I have to have capital yeah. gains okay. offset my Okay, my and I, I just so You can to... carry over those losses. If you don't have the gains now, can't you carry over those? How long can you carry them over? Uh, capital losses, I think you can carry them, f I want to say forever. Oh, okay. really? Yeah. Okay. So you can use them in the future. Yeah. If okay. you want to, but, but then well, some then, people must do that then. Some people yeah. must just bank but, losses. If, if you feel comfortable with that. Well, if you bought one, the Nortel stock I bought when that was like the first stock I ever bought when I was working in the region appeal and it went to zero. Eventually I got to use those losses. Yeah. Did you though? I think so, but it was oh, it was like like it was like two thousand bucks. Yeah, at know. the time though, that might as well have been, felt like a million dollars. It did, yeah, because I had never really invested in something before, and I was twenty. Well, I don't know, whatever. Oh my God, 20, so my Oracle shares, I never claimed those losses. You must have. No, did personal taxes? Then you still you know, have. I don't want to say the person's name. Yeah, I never used those losses. But then you still have them. It, it was like it was like away. a Solomon. What's that company in the states? Don't worry, Tom's really Solomon. good at keeping record. Tom's really good at. So, <laughs> who's that company that I had? Those Oracle shares. It was like Solomon Smith Barney. Is that a company? I have no idea. No, I think I, it was a trading company out of the U.S. Because like it was all through the U.S. that we had these things. Yeah, I remember it was really yeah. complicated for us as Canadians through the Oracle stock purchase plan or whatever. Yeah, Microsoft's the same. Yeah, um, but I think that company's gone. Like I probably have no records. So That's my recollection, I have ten million dollars in losses. <laughs> okay, I, I had the Nortel shares as well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, did you? Yeah. That's why you tried to catch the falling life. Uh, life. I, well, I, worked, I, said I, worked, I worked there for. Oh, that's right. Oh, I forgot. Five or six years. Oh, oh, you didn't. So you're taking for subtle. You got some. You got. You got a discount on yours, and I, 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 I bought them a market at least. Oh no, I got a discount and then never did anything with them. <laughs> yeah, out of way. I'm gonna remember that you took subtle jabs at the yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah, because this up. is where it's coming from. You have Nortel in your history. It's all making sense. I was, I was pretty young at the time, though. So. That's, I'm a bad. pretty young person myself. Okay. There, hey, look, there's lessons to to seeing the value of something go up and as it comes down. And I'm not saying that, uh, this with big, I'm talking with anything. Holding totally, on to it sure. and just saying like, oh, I'm just going to hold till it goes back up. I'm going to hold till it goes back up. Because, you know, there's no guarantees that actually happen. Sometimes right. you got to cut the losses and go. And again, this isn't a Bitcoin thing. I'm just talking in general. No, the tech stocks, I, 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 I should pull up the chart. I'm pretty sure, I think it was over a decade for Oracle to come back to where it was, you know, in the tech bubble. I have a feeling it was like 15, 16 years. I think there was a few splits in there and stuff. I should look at that. Um, but I think it was over 10 years. I'll look so. at some of the run-ups that we had during COVID for certain things. I mean, take your pick. Maybe it's, maybe it's Zoom. Take Zoom yeah. as an example. They had this massive run up because the demand just skyrocketed. They've totally revamped their platform. They have more offerings and stuff. I know at one point, last time I saw a few months ago, it had come all the way back down. Um, what's you know, it going to take for it to go back up there? You know, maybe on, it does, maybe it doesn't. On that note, I was in Sherway Gardens on the weekend. Uh, by the way, I was watching the Buffalo Bills game on my phone stream. I wasn't going to watch the end of it, but it was the craziest Buffalo Bills game. It was like one of the best games ever where Bills lost again. But uh, I'm a Bills fan. Uh, only recently again, like I kind of ignored them since Thurman Thomas couldn't find his helmet at the sidelines on the Super Bowl. That was like my low point. And... Uh, and I'm watching this game and I'm walking around the mall. My family's doing some shopping and stuff and all the stores are packed, but I walk by Peloton, crickets. Oh, all man. the stores are packed, sure way, all the stores. Peloton, there's no one in there. And I was just thinking, cause that, that stock had a huge ramp up. So you're right, it's that kind of company that- Like, like if you're holding onto it now, yeah. you might just- or may, Yeah, but who are, losses. and who are we to obviously know? True, but that's 100%. the kind of example that it goes through your head. Like, wow, when, is it, when does that thing come back? Okay. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's certainly, it's not just Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin's down right now, but 
I mean, lots well, of every, stuff is everything's down. down. Lots yeah. of stuff is down right now. So well, I, I think even oh, Am- you're being Amazon, very kind there, Andrew. That was a very another point earned back. You, <laughs> okay. But even Amazon came all the way back to where it's you yeah, know where, yeah. where it was or close to it. Or yeah, yeah. Right? I remember Nick and I remember. I remember talking about Amazon in the 2000s somewhere and thinking, listen, I'm this play, this company doesn't make money. Like I'm I'm smart yeah. enough to know that if it doesn't make money. Stock's probably not going to do well. Doesn't the stock go on just like this epic well, it didn't 20 year money. run? Yeah. Yeah. But for a long time, Plus, I don't know if it still makes money. I don't know how they're claiming it all right now, but I don't know the net income situation. Well, I don't know all the details, but I know the thing that actually got it profitable and made it really profitable was the Amazon Web Services. It wasn't even the sure. retail side. Yeah. You know, that's, I, I know that much, and I didn't know what changed from that point. I was like, oh, missed that bandwagon, but they, they, they played that off really well. And now half the world in computing runs off Amazon. If their if their stuff goes down, like everything collapses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Okay, so on the tax front, then um, anything other in that area of just uh, gains and losses that people should be uh, aware of? I think it, most people might have been aware of, of that, but I just want to clear up that whole thirty day rule because I don't think yeah. some people were. Yeah, aware that's of that. the that's the biggest thing is is some people don't know that you you can't just sort of sell it and buy it back, um, but. Just wait 30 days and you should be okay. Okay. And then if you're, can you clear this up? Sometimes I get a little confused describing it. Why, if you have a corporation with a year end of like May 31st, June 31st, uh, July 31st, whatever it is, can you wait six months or whatever it is to do your taxes or like, you know, that whole six month thing. So that's what I was getting confused trying to explain this to someone. Can you, can you talk about (laughs) this? So, uh, so, uh, there's different payment and filing deadlines, which is actually similar to personal if you're self-employed. So, with a corporation, if it is a Canadian control, so if it's a small Canadian corporation that essentially, so if it if its profit is under five hundred thousand dollars, it has three months after its year end to pay any taxes that it owes. A corporation that's not an active business or a or a small corporation has two months after its year end to pay any taxes that it owes. All Canadian corporations have six months to file a tax return. Okay, got it. So you have six months to file the return, but if you've owed money, you're going to start accumulating interest on whatever you owed at those either at three months or two, or, or two months or three or two months or yeah. three months. Got and, it. And I think from my from my understanding, one of the benefits if you have like a mid year or or July in, July thirty first July thirty first year end is then you have the option to if you're going to bonus out money or something like that, you have the option. To to shareholders, there's the option to bone because it's six months. You have the options to bonus it in that calendar year for the personal tax or the following calendar year because you don't have to file January. until the end of January. Is that right? Something like that yeah. or no? Yeah. So with bonuses, <clears throat> you have six months to pay them. So you could they could be paid in the subsequent calendar year, for which personal for tax. personal purposes, or if you're dividend if you're paying dividends, you can declare those dividends. You know, but for argument's sake, based on your corporate year end, so that would be July, which puts them in the current calendar year, or you could declare them on a calendar year basis, which might put them into the next calendar year. So by having an off calendar corporate year end, you can potentially move the consequences that the impact on the personal taxes from year to year. Yeah. And is that a, is that a tool that's useful to you as an accountant or is it more just people hear about this thing and it's ultimately a pain in the ass? Um, I think there's certainly circumstances that it's beneficial because some people might, if you're bonusing out to an individual that's going to have to pay tax on that, they can push it out into the next calendar year. That's right. Yeah. So potentially I could take out 600 this year, pay tax on three this year and pay tax on three next year. Okay. Which is beneficial to me from a personal tax perspective. And that's the- Got it. The tax. uh, Well, I mean, at one point, what I've heard is anytime, like as a rule of thumb in accounting, I don't know this stuff, but it's just like anything you can defer, you want to try to defer. You know, I guess unless you expect your income to jump up or something, there's going to be some financial situations going to change in some way, then maybe you don't want to. But ultimately, if you can defer, you try to defer things. Is yep. that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, certainly, I mean, from, from a corporate tax perspective, it's a little bit less important um, only because the corporate tax rates are, are fixed. We don't have marginal tax rates in a corporation. So, you know, the first 500K right now, I pay 12.2%. On anything over and above that, I pay twenty six and a half percent, and and that's what it is. So whether I'm a dollar over five hundred or five hundred over five hundred, I still have twenty six and a half percent. 
on the personal side, it makes a much, much, much bigger difference. Because once I'm over 220, I'm paying 53.5% on each additional dollar that I earn. So it's, there's a lot more strategy involved in keeping my income under 220 and spreading it out over multiple years than taking it all at once. Got it. Is, oh, go ahead, Nick. I was going to ask about joint venture specifically. I don't know if it's, so it's a little bit of a different topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So when people are doing joint venture agreements, I know from a legal perspective, there's a number of things to put in there that you want to outline. The, the, does anything come to mind for taxes outside of like, you know, where the revenue, what the revenue split's going to be and who's contributing what financially. I guess those are the two big ones and an obvious one. So if people are coming into the table with a joint venture and someone's contributing 25,000, someone's 75,000, obviously you want that outlined, you know, how that's going to be paid back and, and those things. But is there anything else that really comes to mind? Cause to me, it, I, I can't really think of anything. I just don't know if I'm missing something. Uh, I don't, I can't think of anything. So the, the three important things for me are what's the split we're, that we're splitting revenue and expense on generally on an annual basis and that the eventual sale of the property is split between the, the joint ventures. So those are the three things that, I mean, from a tax perspective, that's what we want to know. How are we splitting it? What's being split? And on, <clears throat> on what time period? Yeah, okay. If I have a corporate structure set up and I have enough money in the corporate structure to purchase to use some of the money or savings in that corporate structure. And I can I use that corporate structure to buy a home that I have in my own name and, you know, as an investment property. And then, um, and then is that, is that a mechanism that is, is kind of like CR, like I'm the corp buys, uh, buys a place I have in my own name. And what that allows for me then is to use some tax efficiencies and pull out some, some cash from the corporate structure um, because like I'm the owner. I'm the person. That's a good question. Are you following? No, Tom, like I'm just, I guess like Tom's I, drawing an arrow on the piece of paper yeah. between a square box and a, and a, yeah, yeah. And like, a, so I've a, a home. I've accumulated some cash in a corporate structure. I own a property in my personal name. Um, oh, okay. So you're going the, okay. All right. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I, it's a, my personal family home. Okay. I own my personal family home, but I'm moving. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I don't want to sell my personal family home. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in a situation where I don't need that cash from the personal family home to buy my next personal family home. So my corp is going to buy that home. And it's going to become an income property for me. I'm going to, I'm going to um, use it as an mm-hmm. investment. That's one way to then have my corp buy another investment property from me as a person. And then the corp owes me money as a person that I can then extract from my personal, my, my own corporate structure in a tax efficient manner. Yes. Yeah. So that is correct. That I know correct. I explained that yep. very confusing in a confusing manner, but that's a, <laughs> that's a possible thing to do. Yes. That's above board legal. Yep. It's, so uh, essentially the, your personal residence, let's just take an example of you bought it, you lived in it for the whole time that it was owned. It was never used to earn income through rental or business. Correct. Cause that makes it simple. You can then essentially, because you can use the principal residence exemption to exempt the tax on a, on the sale of that property, whether it's a third party sale or a sale to yourself being your own corporation, you can sell that property to your own corporation at fair market value, not pay personal tax because you use the principal residence exemption. And now your corporation owns that property and it can rent it on a go forward basis, but it now owes you the fair market value of the asset that you sold. it. So if you have cash built up in your corporation from something else, that is a mechanism that can be used to extract that cash without having to pay personal tax. It's beautiful, no? Uh, it, it certainly is. It, is. It, is it difficult? It's difficult to pull off because I guess you'll need you need enough cash in your corporation to pull that off, or, or uh, yeah, I mean you do, can you can even have that cash come out over time. So so there's a benefit to doing it. I, I think the complexity or the the difficulty would be, you know, having the property. Um, sure. And, and being able to not have to sell it to buy your new one. The other side of that is, is if there is a mortgage on the property, mm-hmm. the mortgage is likely going to have to go to the corporation as well. So the corporate has to qualify for its own finances Potentially, to buy yes. this property. And it reduces the benefit, right? So if I've got a fair market value of my property is a million dollars, but I got an $800,000 mortgage on it. When I transfer both to the corporation, all I get is 200,000 because I, it took on my debt. Got it. So that that strategy works really well if there's no mortgage. So now I can transfer the property to the, to the corporation, get my million dollars back, and then remortgage it in the corporation 
and essentially put the million dollars back in the corporation. So if the mortgage goes with the property, if the, if the corp's assuming the existing mortgage, it's not as good. It's not as good just because I'm only going to get the net. Yeah, got it. Okay. But if, if, but if the corp gets its own financing. After the fact, after the transfer, now that's the corporate's problem. Yeah, that's not, the, its problem. Yours. I'm personally owed all that money, which I can then take from the corporation as payment for the property and not pay personal tax on it. That's correct. Mm-hmm. And then that, the, that's not a very appreciated strategy. Like I, I feel like when I explain that to people, they're kind of blown away. Sorry, Nick, don't lose I, that thought. I, I think that the, because it's not always easy to keep the principal residence. Sure, you right? need the money from the right. that residence. A lot of Usually times, people are upgrading and right. need that money. You, you, you want to, you, your next property is gonna be bigger and better than mm-hmm. the one you're selling or the, or the one you have. Um, and a lot of times to keep the mortgage on the new property low, you're gonna need the funds from the existing. Yeah. So, so I think You'd be in a pretty fortunate it, position to be able to pull that off yes. where you're stretching yourself to do it for a little while, but it, but it's but it a, a tax efficient yes, strategy. It is. Uh, okay. When the corporation goes to sell it, so let's say the corporation bought it and it was you know, a million dollars and it sells it a few years later, I don't know, whatever, 200, $500,000 more, whatever, it makes the math easy. How does the tax work to them? So obviously they pay, they would pay tax on the gain, mm-hmm. but what percent tax are they paying on that gain? Okay, so so in a corporation, so let's say that the corporation gets it for a million and then sells it for 1.5. The corporation now has a $500,000 gain, half of that's taxable, so 250 is taxable in the corporation, and that 250 is taxed at 50%. Oh, at 50%. Or 50%. Okay. So it'd be very similar then to the personal tax rate, I guess, really, right? Because I, I don't know. Uh, it, I know it varies, but... It, it would be if I had $200,000 of other income and then I added the gain on top of it. Oh, really? That gain doesn't count? In the personal side, that gain doesn't count as to, mar- to go towards the marginal tax rate? It does. But so if I had if I had no other income personally and I only had the gain then I pay marginal rates all the way up to 50%. Oh, got it, got where it. Where in the corporation, I pay 50% on the 50%. Okay. So you gotta have some plans for it to hold on to it for a while or something like that for it to that's be right. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with the corporation is that that's not, on the personal side, when I sell and I pay tax, that's my final tax obligation. In the corporation, when I pay that 50% tax, it's not the end result. Once that corporation pays a dividend out to an individual, the corporation gets back 30%, so it actually only pays 19, and then the individual pays tax on the dividend. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that whole bit's always, on the, I just always ignore that part. I'm like, I'll let you guys handle that. And what about if the corp buys my primary place of residence like we just described, but then I rent back from the corp? So, so you, you can do that. It may not be the most tax efficient because, so let's say it's your principal residence, you sell it to your, to your corporation, you claim the principal residence exemption. Mm-hmm. Now the corporation owns it, and then you rent it back because you don't want to move. Correct. You just, you just wanted to get the cash sure. out of the corp. Yes. So now you're paying your own corporation rent. Mm-hmm. So you're putting your own money into your own corporation <laughs> and then paying tax on it. It's at very, 50%. It's very, it's very circular. So it's, it's <laughs> not necessarily efficient. Yeah. Because then if I want to get my cash back, I got to take it back out and pay tax I, on it. Pay tax again. So I'm getting either rent as an income on the corp side, paying tax there. If I want the income back out personally, I'm paying tax again. It's just, it's too much tax. Weren't we talking about something when I think, I feel like a couple weeks ago, we were having a discussion about people working from home and how it could impact them selling their properties or something. I don't know. This Because I think if they start me. taking um, a chunk of their home. as Well, we were talking about utilities though. I said they can, they can write off, they could claim the utilities as tax write-offs we thought we're like, it feels like they could claim some utilities in it, but as not long square as they didn't, footage. can't claim any square footage, for, then they wouldn't be able, then it shouldn't impact their principal residence exemption. Did we have that right? So, so yeah. So if you work from home and you know, I like using, how he, Andrew takes a sigh. Well, we do, he's like, really, you guys, this is what you're asking. <laughs> well, our questions are so simple. They're like, well, this is what it is. Yeah, he's just well, I just mean, it applies to a lot of people. Totally. Now. Yes, for, for sure. So, yeah. so I mean, home office is normally, um, you take the square footage that you're using as your home office. So let's let's call it 10%. Oh, and you can only claim that much of your utility bills. That's right. Yeah. So you can claim 10% of your utilities, your internet, uh, your internet, and that's pretty much it. Mm-hmm. And then maintenance that's specific to the, the location okay. or to the space that you're using. And then if you're a commissioned employee, you can actually claim other expenses as well. But for non-commissioned, you get basically utilities and internet. Um, but the the 
where you could potentially use your lose your principal residence exemption. So for a home to be eligible as a principal residence, it must be principally used as your personal residence, which generally means it has to be used more than 50% as where you live, okay? If you're renting a portion of it and you're also using a portion of it for your home office, whether that be for self-employment or as part of a corporate setup or however, and that total percentage of rental and business use exceeds 50%, then you potentially impact your principal residence exemption because now you're not using your home principally as your personal residence. You're using more than 50% of it for rental and business. You can impact your ability to claim your principal residence exemption on the whole property. So you can impact it. It's just, you tend to have to have something else. Like, and we see more of it where people are renting like a basement you know, mortgages going up and everything else. So now they're going to rent their basement to make back some of the money to help them make mortgage payments. So now they're renting 30% of their house, but they're also both spouses are working from home and they're each claiming, you know, 15% as their home office. Mm -hmm. Now we're 50%. Thank God. Oh, you have to be careful with that. some people are going to get into jams. They're not going to realize if they do that. Yeah. yeah. So you have to be careful with stuff like that. But in, in, in the past we didn't tend to have, you know, Home office, home office, yeah. rental, we yeah. have sort of one or the other. Mm. Um, now we're seeing more where we're getting yeah. all. I think, I think we're going to see more and more. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask about people, because we've seen a number of investors now that are leaving Canada for a prolonged period of time. And I don't know if they're coming back periodically or something. They're keeping their investment portfolio here. And they're just going, you know, they're like, hey, we're going to move here for a year or a couple years, or we're going to travel the world for, you know, go to multiple locations. How does that, um, I, I think there's some, like I, I know you still have to be claiming the income here. Like how does that work from a tax perspective in Canada? If you're not physically here, but you're still earning the income here, do you ha does it change if you're out of the country for so long? Because I know with like the uh, OHIP and things like that, if you, you know, if you don't come back every so often, you spend so much time here a year, you lose those benefits. Does anything like that happen? Or as long as you're claiming the income here and through Canada, you're paying your tax rate through here Canada, in Canada, and CRA is getting their, their ounce of blood, as Tom puts it, then you're good to do whatever you want. Um. I, I see. There's never a simple answer with CRA. Well, it's with, just like with non-resident stuff, it gets really, really complicated. Oh, okay. So, but but they're res they're Canadian citizens, and they're just so Canada taxes on residency. So whether you're a citizen or not yeah. doesn't necessarily matter. Okay, and residency is defined as the, and it's not even clear cut. <laughs> okay, six, six months and a day out of every year. No, in the it's, country. it's based on whether you have whether your residential ties are more with Canada than another country. Residential ties being family, property, uh, Got it. bank accounts, memberships, mortgages, all that kind of stuff. So all the things that mm. you would do. You know, like everyday, everyday life That's stuff. That's right. So the closer your ties or the more ties you have with Canada, the more likely you're gonna be considered a resident of Canada. If you're considered a resident of Canada, you're taxable in Canada on your worldwide income. So wherever you earn income in the world, you pay tax in Canada. If you're not considered a resident of Canada, you only pay tax in Canada on anything that's resident in Canada. So real property, RSPs, RIFs, TFSAs, all that kind of stuff. When you withdraw from that, you're still subject to tax in Canada, even though you might not be a resident of Canada at the time that you make the withdrawal. So there's a big difference between whether you're considered a resident of Canada or not on how you're taxed in Canada. Got it, wow. And so, so that gets really complicated because, and when you cease to be a Canadian resident, and I know we talked about this mm. before, you're deemed to dispose of everything you yeah. own. There's some, horror, oh, there's a bunch of horror exceptions. Horror show. There's a bunch of exceptions, real property being one of them. Essentially, you're deemed to dispose of anything that- I'm just gonna not run out of the country. Care. I'm just gonna run. <laughs> just run. Just run and, and just find me. Yeah, just try and find out where I am. Yeah, because that's a nightmare. It, 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 it really is. is. Yeah. Yeah. It is. So, you're, so you're, you have that big deemed disposition when you cease to be resident. So, you know, the, the six months in a day that you mentioned yeah. is... Is that like healthcare services? Normally, it's the other direction. So someone who's in Canada, oh, who's okay. not a Canadian resident, no, normally, who's here for six months in a day, they can be deemed to be a Canadian resident and then be subject to tax in Canada on their worldwide income, even though they're not 
they don't think they're a resident here. Yeah, got it. I think the rule in the U.S. is similar. Okay. So you can be, if you spend winters in Florida, you have to be careful because you could potentially be considered a resident of the U.S. Got it. As well as a resident. I always of thought Canadians were coming back because something to do with health care services and stuff. You couldn't be out of the country more than six months, but maybe it's twofold. Maybe it's really like you're not get, wanting to get resident status in the U.S. and having to pay taxes in the U.S. That's right. Yeah. So and you, I think you there escape is. back up to Canada. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is the OHIP and the and the health plan. And, and that's that six months. That's six months and a day out of the year, or consecutively. Uh, or that's not defined either. It's not it, much it is defined. Is. That oh, is okay. actually defined, okay. and I think it's like uh, 180 days over a three year. Like it's a, oh, there's a period gotcha. of time. I don't remember exactly what the the criteria is, but that is explicitly outlined in in the mm-hmm. rules. Wow. Um, anything before we wrap anything that's coming to mind that people are, um, you're seeing a lot of that people are kind of, yeah. Like you know, how do we pay zero tax? How do we make lots yeah. of money and not pay any tax? No, I remember, <laughs> I remember, um, uh, I would say don't live in Canada. <laughs> your your father in law, Dennis once told us that he met uh, with some investors yeah. and they already paid no tax, I guess. And he came to Dennis and said, well, here's our corporations and here's our stuff. Like, what can you help us do? And uh, he's like, well, let me get this straight. You already pay like no tax in some some way. You found some magical way to pay no tax. And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, well, if you found that way and you want more from me, like there's nothing I can do for you. Like, what am I supposed to be able to do for you at this point? You want the government to start paying you? So it's it's funny. I think some people just have expectations that are not real. You know? oh, for sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, yeah, I okay. talk to you a dozen that of those every week. Oh, really? Uh, okay. But so, I mean... In Canada, in my opinion, it's just, it's not possible to pay no tax. It's just, it's not a thing. Um, uh, and, and follow the rules. Or at least somewhat follow the rules. I guess that's important. Yeah, yeah. Legal. We're, we're all paying tax. Yeah. yeah, like when I hear you say that, what comes to mind for me is like, oh my gosh, like a, you pay an income tax, then you pay an HST tax. And if you're buying gas, there's tax bake, baked into that. If I'm going to the LCBO, there's like some tax baked into the alcohol. Like out of your dollar, how much is actually yours and not going to some not tax? If you take $1 and you earn it and then go get gas and buy a <laughs> bottle of wine for the weekend, how much of that dollar after tax and tax on gas and tax on alcohol? Now all the carbon tax. On you might as well buy a pack of smokes, isn't there tax to, on- to heat your ho- Yeah, to heat your home. It's not just the sales tax. You have to, the carbon offset tax. A the carbon offset too, tax. Right? Oh man. So no. for each yeah, dollar, actually, we I probably don't have three to four cents that are yeah. ours. Yeah. I would say three to four cents out of every dollar is yours. Yeah. So you are working for three to four cents here in Canada, but you have some, you know, Right back to what you started with. How do you want to pay the government tax? <laughs> yeah, how do you choose to pay the government? So today, if you're listening to this in your car and you decide for yourself, how would you like to spend your time to pay the government? Because that's ultimately, <laughs> oh my gosh, what a horrible way to yeah, think of life. Is, yeah. yeah, let's take that back. It's worst it's, podcast it does, ever. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. This is not our life on our terms at all. This is the actual opposite of everything we stand for. Your life, your terms, yeah. after tax. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. sponsored by the, your government. <laughs> <laughs> your life on our terms with our tax <laughs> rules. Adrian, always a, a pleasure having you here. Um, how would people, who do you, uh, you know, who are your clients and how would they find you if they want, if they're a new client, they want to start working with you? Uh, they can go to our, our website, um, uh, Lagoy Professional Corporation, just do a Google search, you'll get to it. Um, all our contact information is there. Um, we tend to work with, you know, personal tax, corporate tax, small business. That's our bread and butter. Cool. Always appreciate these chats. We always learn something. Really, um, you know, thank you for this. And I'll meet you in the training room for your three <laughs> fundamentals class. Thank you for this. Thing. Thank you very much, guys. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, your life, your terms.